Education is what really separates us from the other living species on this planet. It's the system or organization we use to capture the essence of our experience in generation and after generation, to codify it, process it, condense it, and pass it on to the future generations so that each successive generation can start off with the cumulative knowledge and experience of the past and move rapidly into the future without having to reinvent not only the wheel but everything else and make all the mistakes of the past. But today, not only in Serbia, not only in this region, but all over the world, we face a new challenge. That the speed and magnitude and complexity of the changes in global society are so great that our educational institutions are simply not able to keep up with the challenges before us. And rushing to teach the newest technologies or algorithms or uh, employment opportunities, however essential it is, is simply not enough to prepare us, our youth, and our societies for the future. Last night we had a, a fireside chat without the fire uh, with about 25, 30, maybe 40 participants in this conference, speakers and panelists in this conference, we didn't talk about solutions. We asked the participants to talk about the questions or the problems they think that we should be addressing at this conference, going beyond the traditional issues that are being addressed in educational conferences all over the world, in which, in fact, we have been addressing in our uh, forums and discussions. We heard many very important issues that address the issue of employment. How are we going to make, meet the skills gap? How are we going to address the challenges of the fourth industrial revolution? How are we going to prepare youth for lifelong learning? As the prime minister emphasized, how are we going to encourage students not just to absorb knowledge passively, but to think and think for themselves? Because whatever we teach them today, Whatever they learn today, it's simply not going to be sufficient to meet the challenges and complexity of the future. How are we going to re-instill as the core of our academic tradition, our educational system, the importance of values and character, which was there in the origins of, of education before science sanitized, with all due respect to all of us representing the scientific community, but before we sanitized uh, our life and existence to the point where we leave out the subjective dimension, which is so important to the vitality, success, survivability, and progress of the society. How are we going to address not only the issues within each academic discipline, but which Dr. Kostic mentioned in his comments yesterday, how are we going to overcome the problems from the disciplinary barriers, which are so deeply entrenched not only deeply entrenched in our structures and in our faculties, but deeply entrenched in our thinking, where we have managed to divide and compartmentalize a complex interrelated reality into so many small, we have a hundred disciplines and sub, a thousand sub-disciplines that are taught in the United States alone, and each one creating greater and greater knowledge and expertise of a special expert function while losing sight more and more from the wider connectivity with which everything has to be related. Last month, we had participated in a conference of IEEE with the systems engineers who were working on the leading edge technology in the world, who are learned nothing about what's going on in the world except technology, know nothing about the society and the impact of the society that, that's, that's being impacted by the technology or the economy than what they may learn outside the educational system because they've been focused so much on keeping up with advances in the specialized technology of their field. The World Academy looks at the big picture. We're not divided into disciplinary uh, specializations, though we have representatives of all disciplines of the arts and sciences and other professions 
uh, in, in our academy, we're trying to look at the global challenges we face. And we find very often, perhaps almost always, the real problems fall within the link, the interstices between disciplinary knowledge. They fall within the area where the disciplines remain separate, where their perspectives are different. We have 200 years of economic history and economic thought that until very recently considered the environment an externality. We now know, as Professor Durison said last night, the world is possessed by a fanaticism of neoliberalism, which is simply neglecting the tremendous eros eroding, corroding impact of neoliberalism on our societies, on opiate uh, addiction in the United States and suicide rates uh, in other places, uh, which doesn't take into account that our free market system, which was originally, I believe, inspired on the principles of liberty and freedom for the individual, is now undermining our democratic institutions by creating such widening inequality and sense of alienation by parts of society. Where does it come in our education? Where are we addressing the critical issues, ecological, economic, social, political issues? And if our educational system is not doing it, who is doing it? Who is preparing our future business leaders to really understand that a financial system that's totally divorced from the real economy and, is, and as has money chasing money for profits rather than building real, creating real jobs and producing real goods and services to meet real human needs is undermining the very fabric of our society. Who's responsible for that discussion if it's not in the universities, if it's not in our educational system? And I don't mean to minimize the difficulty of this challenge. We have a whole long heritage behind us. We've all been through that process of fragmented disciplinary education. We've all been raised with the idea that knowledge is something we get from outside rather than something that's born and awakened in us. We've, we've learned to depend on the external environment to give us what we need to make us valuable. And now we have what one of our speakers last night called academic capitalism, where we put a price and value not only on knowledge, but on the human being who's been through the process. The greatest asset are our people as human beings. How far is our educational system really developing our capacity as human beings? Our emotional intelligence, our value system, our confidence, our strength, our courage to speak out. And if it's not doing that, is it really doing service to the future? We have the added capacity. We have to continue. We have to continue upgrading our skills. We have to continue adapting to our technical requirements as the society goes on. But I think if we reflect honestly, we simply know this is not enough. This is not sufficient. This is not going to solve our problems. And if, it manage, if Serbia manages to replicate and duplicate the best educational system in the world, it's going to be plagued by all of the problems that I see in my society and the other countries I see around the world because we don't, they don't have the answer. They don't have the model for the future. And my hope in coming to Serbia is this is a country with a tradition of not just thinking, but thinking for yourself and thinking differently. We need new models. We don't have to cast away the best of anything. We should receive the best of everything, but the best of everything is not enough. It's very difficult to create a new model and demonstrate it in a country the size of India, where I spend most of my time, or the United States. But we've got a, a small, compact society here with a tradition behind it. Can't we do better and not just try to catch up? And I don't underestimate the challenge at all. We know many dimensions of that already. We know we have to have a shift in it, a radical shift from the passive education, which is teaching, to the active education, which is learning. We know we need a shift from 
the, the paradigm of a subject-centered education. The real thing we need to educate is not about subjects. This is not a mass production line. We don't need mass production line. We need every individual coming out of this with the capacity, unique capacities, to contribute uniquely to society. We need that change from the subject to the student. We know we have to break down the disciplinary barriers, and I would give credit to the natural sciences have done much better at it than the social sciences, where, where I'm, which I represent and which I'm working in all the time, where we've divided things so much that the very concept of the human being in economics is a different species, maybe from a different planet than the human being I studied in psychology. And frankly speaking, I'm not sure that that human being has much to do with you and I either. Uh, we've got a nice abstract knowledge divorced from the real reality. We're teaching principles, we're teaching abstractions, when what our students need is something that will give them an understanding of what's going on in the society. It's not enough they understand what's been written in the past or in the textbooks or in the laboratory. They have to understand the world they're living in, otherwise what are we giving them? We're, cre we're educating them to be another species out of place in the world, like human beings seem to be out of place on our planet uh, right now, and we've got apparently serious people thinking we should move somewhere else because we've, we better give up on this one. What's wrong with our thinking and our education if we can't figure out the way to live in, uh, in a place like this and we can't live harmoniously together? And we know many other aspects of this shift. It's not enough we shift to the student. It's not enough that we educate the mind. We have to educate the mind in different ways of thinking, which are there in our tra tra past. They're there in our different civilizations. The analysis in dividing all reality down to its fundamentals has given us great scientific discoveries, but we know more and more the complexity of the world can't be resolved by reductionist mechanistic thinking. We've got to think in synergy. We've got to teach our students, our youth, to think of the whole. And it's not enough we just assemble the parts and aggregate them. We've got to be able to link it to what they're feeling subjectively. We need an education and a way of thinking that includes our subjective reality, not just the objective world we see around us. And these are the themes that we've been exploring in the academy and the consortium and very gratified that we have uh, a, a wonderful opportunity with a wonderful uh, range of speakers and panelists and participants to explore them further. Because our hope is not that we, we discuss here how Serbia can catch up with uh, other countries, but how Serbia can evolve models that others need. Just three days ago, I was in Geneva representing the World Academy at a new project we're launching with the United Nations, which we call, for want of a better, more clear term, global leadership in the 21st century. And our colleagues within the UN system were admitted later, I'm glad they didn't tell me beforehand, that they were very skeptical about this. It was the first time an NGO was invited to represent to UN organizations and partner with the UN on a project like this. And I didn't realize how skeptical they were about us getting a reception uh, from their colleagues within the system because there's so much cynicism today about multilateralism, about the international institutions, about the support and attitude of the nation states and the possibility of addressing the challenges that we face. Well, if our education isn't helping us face those global existential challenges, what are we preparing our youth for if we can't do that? And this project, which we'll talk more about for those of you who can join us on the 14th, is how do we lead a world where nobody's in charge? Well, after all, we got this far in a world with nobody in charge because nobody's ever been in charge of the whole world. But now we seem to be grappling more and more with more centers of power uh, and influence, whether it's the business community or the governments or the international organizations or NGOs, but how do we lead together? How do we create a movement that can respond to the aspirations of the young generation, uh, Greta Thunberg's uh, generation, uh, that they want a planet that works for them? Uh, so we need a new knowledge. 
And those who participated in our meeting on 8th agreed on one thing. For all their training in public administration and leadership in economics and other fields of development, we don't have that knowledge today. We are not teaching that knowledge today. What could be more valuable than the next generation come out with an understanding of the world we live in and how we have to cooperate and how we have to lead, not just from above down, but awaken the aspirations and release the energy and initiative of everybody from the bottom up for a value-based world. And in our discussions last night, I was so pleased at the variety of issues and questions that were raised because I think they all belong on the table. Uh, we can't look for simplistic uh, uh, solutions as if education is only there for one purpose. Education is there to bind and develop our, civil, our human civilization, and now it's emerging as a global civilization. So the challenge and responsibility is greater than ever before, and it's a waste of time to blame anybody for it. We're a species learning in the process. The only question is, can we step forward to learn all that we need to learn to make this happen? That's why the motto of the academy is leadership and thought that leads to action. We do need a lot of action, but we need a lot of new thinking in order to ensure that that action's taking us in the right direction. And I have deepest hopes and aspirations that this conference is gonna help us do it. Thank you.